Welcome to Laptop Radio. Today I have Roy Sterling on the show with us, and he is a health entrepreneur, author, keynote speaker. Hello, Roy. Hi, Michelle. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Where are you now? I'm in Vienna, Austria. Uh, I'm originally from Israel, from Tel Aviv, and in the last two years I've been residing in Vienna. Awesome. Um, today's topic is going to be on the future of healthcare. And Roy, before we talk about healthcare, I wanted to ask you, what is your story? Oh, it's, it's a bit of a long one, so I'm, I will try to make it a bit shorter. Basically, uh, I'm a kind of a classic dreamer. Um, ever since I remember myself, I wanted to be a doctor. And when I finally got to the age that I can actually enroll into medical school, um, some things happened uh, with my health and I found myself uh, admitted into a hospital uh, a few weeks before starting medical school and this little admission became a long saga of recurrent admissions, uh, chronic illness and eventually disability. Um, it took me a few years to understand that uh, healthcare in the way it's constructed today is not built to serve patients, but it's built actually to maintain um, the viability of the system because of all the stresses around it. And I had to basically take matter to my own hands. Um, first of all, to diagnose my own condition because uh, I've been undiagnosed for um, back then more than five years. And I had to design my own rehabilitation plan uh, and then to embark on a journey to fix healthcare. Uh, so that's what I'm doing, I've been doing uh, in the last few years since I got a bit better. So, um, yeah, sorry. That's a really interesting story when you mentioned that you have to diagnose yourself with your condition. It sounds like healthcare today is broken and in we're in the midst of the corona crisis right now and exactly what is broken with healthcare today oh so, so we have a lot of things broken we have actually very <laughs> little things that are unbroken in healthcare and you happen to live in the richest country on the planet with the presumably the best theoretical best healthcare system but Obviously, it's not. Um, for me, uh, as an expert patient, uh, I would say that, first of all, um, there is something I always say in my talks, that healthcare is the only industry in the world in which uh, the customer view doesn't matter at all. And uh, it's a bit funny, but uh, healthcare is supposed to be a system that provides basically health services to patients or if we go kind of uh, to the dream scenario, actually engaged in prevention and uh, promotion of health. But first of all, the thing that is broken the most is the, the way patients are being treated. The second thing is the allocation of resources, which is completely distorted because we are trying to maintain the sickness of, its own, uh, of, of the system itself instead of uh, building something sustainable. And third, um, we are in this kind of rat race around the, uh, trying to um, balance budgets of, of healthcare and expenditure and all these big names um, when actually we have the technology, the technology and the capacity today to basically revolutionize, improve healthcare dramatically. First, when we talk about patients, I, I just feel like hospitals and doctors and healthcare should put the customers first in a way because they're be, they're hurt or they need to be treated how do you think we can do that better first of all um there is kind of a battlefield going on between like patient advocates and doctor advocates and i, I think that this is the wrong debate even calling patients customers I don't know, it, it doesn't seem right to me because eventually, you know, you're a customer when you buy something, right? Mm -hmm. But healthcare is a basic kind of civil right. It's a basic, basic right of every human to get access to healthcare. Um, but 
we're not we're not seeing it happen, especially in the U.S. when you have communities that don't even have access to healthcare. In the most developed, most richest country in the world, you have communities, especially in southern countries, they are completely um, disconnected from access to healthcare. I think that um, some hospitals are around the world or health organization, HMOs are trying to kind of raise the flag of what what we are calling patient-centered care or patient-centricity, in which that they were trying to bring back the patient to the center of care. But isn't it a bit stupid to talk about it like this when basically, like, if the patient is not the center of care, who is the center of care, right? The the entire system is supposed to be built around the patient and not uh, the patient as kind of raw material, material going through it like we are doing today. So the first thing I would say is we need to bring back true patient leadership and true community approach to healthcare. And what I mean is that, first of all, patients should be part of the decision-making uh, chain. Um, in the last year, I've served as the patient in residence or basically chief patient for the Austrian uh, Ludwig Boltzmann Institute. It's the um, largest governmental um, funded health research institute. And I was the first one to, to, to held this position and maybe the first one even in the world, at least in the EU. And um, I pushed towards bringing patients uh, into boards of hospitals and HMOs, bringing patients' voice not only in sometimes when you send surveys, but bring patients actually as decision makers, um, bring patients to a leadership level in all chains of care, not only you know in patient organizations, but in hospitals, in HMOs, in clinics. So this is the first thing I would do. The second thing is that I would really go back to the roots of medicine and try to revive community healthcare because I think that community healthcare and um, we see it a lot in education today that we're going back kind of to the roots. Uh, I think that if we do the same in, in healthcare, using technology and empowering the, the teams that are out there, I think that we can kind of rebalance the equation. So these are the two things that I would focus on first. Awesome. For us in the U.S., uh, it's very expensive (laughs) to go to the doctor. And if you don't have health insurance, which is going to be a lot of Americans right now, (laughs) it's very difficult because it's ironic because we have a health crisis, but we also have a very high unemployment rate. And I think a lot of people may be on COBRA. And if that is gone, how do people go to the hospital if they are sick or have COVID? So it really doesn't make sense. The, the thing about it, it, it's kind of funny that um, now because of COVID, we're seeing kind of legislation uh, leaning towards, okay, let's give more people access to healthcare. Okay, let's, let's give them telehealth services and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, but why do we do it only now when, when actually we cannot see the doctors instead of having systems that are set in around the doctor to help you? I don't know if you know it, but a doctor, when he sees a patient in the States, kind of the, the insurance mandate that it's supposed to be some major visits reasons declared that you're supposed to see the doctor for like 15 minutes. A doctor in the U.S. will click his mouth between 600 to one thousand times during those 15 minutes yeah (laughs) it's insane it's insane Um, so we're focusing on all these reforms and crazy things around it but we have the technologies today to actually bring people closer to healthcare and to give people access to healthcare cheaply like the, the 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 money that the u.s spend is sometimes five times more than european countries but in those european countries you see everybody has um access to healthcare, kind of nationally provided uh, insurance and so on. I think that we should really kind of rethink the entire access to healthcare, utilizing the corona crisis and saying, okay, everything is really, really problematic right now. We cannot use healthcare facilities as we used to. Let's use all the arsenal that we have of technology, of regulation, of innovation, and actually kind of restructure it to the, to the matter that we can actually 
utilize those tools that are all already existing, like, you know, like uh, initial uh, diagnosis being uh, uh, done in uh, CVS, uh, for instance, or Walgreens branches, or even Walmart branches, or even doing stuff uh, from home. You know, lo lots of those visits that we actually go see a doctor, we don't really need to see it. And if we're already in the clinic, most of the times when we're going to see our doctors, we're actually being uh, treated by a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, which I believe those roles, those advanced providers will give us the majority of care in the future. So instead of empowering them, we are actually burdening the doctors. So I think we, it, it's a question of restructuring and rebalancing. However, when I was flying on the plane, I met someone in the medical field and he told me that the medical system and the doctors take a long time to adopt to technology and to change. When we're talking about making these innovation or changing the processes of healthcare, it usually takes a crisis to create change because they have a whole system set in place. If everything works for the doctors, why would they change, right? And even if they want to change, how long would that take? I think, Michelle, it, it's a matter of incentive. And what the beautiful thing I saw happening post Obamacare was that um, insurance companies were actually um, intensifying doctors to do something called wellness visits. So actually, you are getting paid not only to maintain sickness, but to actually promote health. So that was one of those drivers to have doctors adopt a new ways of, of working, new protocols, new, new, new technologies even, because this disruption was not only regulatory, it was actually technology-based because the IT systems your doctors are using in the States, most of them are really either archaic or too complicated. And when you put more and more protocols, you actually need to... Uh, adopt more and more new new ways of using those technologies. So I know that it's hard for doctors to adopt technologies, but I think it's not because they're not inclined to do so. It's because we're already building on kind of legacy system, block by block by block, instead of improving and automating what we can. You know, in the in the Second World War, we trained doctors, like the, the United States trained doctors in in four years, and we've seen in those years of war, we've seen uh, amazing medical innovation being adopted but when we're under crisis we tend to be more open to stuff i see doctors today in the u.s adopting in a matter of days from never doing any online visit doing the majority of their care using online visits and i don't know if you know it but your government has enabled uh, basically companies like google and and microsoft to allow using systems like uh, google meet and skype Mm -hmm. um, for those visits because you have the HIPAA compliance requirement and because yeah. of corona we don't have enough system right so uh, until the crisis is over we can actually use any communication tools and we kind of uh, sh shutting one line blind to the complete privacy of the thing just to allow care so I think that we should util utilize this kind of openness right now to ask ourselves the question what is necessary in the tech we're using and the new tech we're using and what is less necessary. In this sense, I must, I must say here that uh, I own a, a startup based in, in the States that automates some of the um, medical records uh, systems. We automate some of the processes. So I'm well aware of the intricacies of doctors trying to learn a new thing. And that's why it's so amazing to look at a doctor with his head completely on the screen while you talk to him, those systems basically can be 60, 70% completely automated because it's all bureaucracy and not clinical flow. Then we can actually release doctors to adopt new technology. The problem with new technology and, and with the openness is that I heard that Facebook has been trying to mine health data of people for a long time. And of course with health data, it's, could affect users and customers' insurance and their life. Being discriminated sucks. So, and being judged and, and paying more sucks. 
because of certain data that these social networks have about you and they can sell these data to ads and other third, third party companies that we may not know about. So with Zoom and other companies and Google Meets and Facebook, if it's not private and we know that these companies are mining data, how can we use an alternative technology to serve the healthcare industry? And what kind of technology should be created to serve those communities with, with privacy in mind? The funny thing is that, you know, for those big companies to actually make those systems HIPAA compliant, it's probably a matter of weeks because when I use any VoIP uh, service that mm -hmm. is HIPAA compliant, it's just basically an open source VoIP protocol being mm -hmm. wrapped in a product, right? Mm -hmm. And those companies are filing for HIPAA compliancy. I think it's just a matter of liability. Those big companies until today either didn't see the market or didn't want to be liable, or didn't want to be in a position they cannot actually use those data. Because those data sets, um, if I cannot record them and use them, maybe it's not my business model, maybe it is. I think that those actually uh, should be more open source and more regulated. Because the problem today is that the doctor is completely shut down in the EMR or EHR, the electronic medical record or, or electronic health record system that he's using, is making this choice and it's so hard for him to, to escape it later. So when he's kind of trapped in this ecosystem, is really dependent on what's compatible with the ecosystem. So what we see today is basically in Corona, we see kind of a, a parallel lines of the government trying to kind of have more access to healthcare because it's either the doctor don't find the solution he wants or he didn't have any incentive to use it before. I think that what should happen is that we should mandate the complete openness of those systems to third party authorized privatized solutions. And um, I always say it, you know, um, the, the largest insurers will in 10 years be Amazon, Google, Facebook, and so on. And those are going to be the healthcare providers that we have probably, and they're leaning towards it. So it's either we let them shape those protocols in their way, or we kind of uh, using our brains and insight, try to create a protocol that will allow us to adapt those changes in technology and insurance because the lines are going to be not parallel it's going to all merge and it's going to be very blurry who is your you know tech provider kind of cell phone provider health provider it's all going to be connected so i think it's going to be interesting time but kind of scary ones for privacy too i agree with you i think that if the big companies wanted to comply with hipaa and also allow the healthcare industry to use their tech, they, they can, but I guess they have no incentive to because they want those data. Do you think that after the crisis, they will stop, that the, the healthcare industry will stop using those technology or do you think that it will continue and thus compromising? It's a really interesting debate because I, I think that eventually what's going to happen is that doctors are going to get used to using those systems and the doctors will want, many doctors will want to stay with them. And that's, that's a bit of a problem because it's much harder to convince a doctor to now completely change the system he's using for telehealth. Because if, if it's going on like this, maybe it's going to have a, you know, a second wave and so on. Maybe we're going to be in an entire year of doctors using those temporary solutions, I think it's going to be a problem. And, and I really not only expect, I think it's the responsibility of the large tech companies to create a sub product at least that is completely for healthcare. Maybe, maybe they're regulated in a way that they cannot do it. It's something that I'm unaware of, but if, if it, there is nothing illegal, but by, by letting doctors use their, I don't know, like for instance, you, you know, when you use Amazon cloud services, right? Mm -hmm. You can choose that your server will be HIPAA compliant, the entire server that you're using. Mm -hmm. So I don't see the big problem in actually 
you know, it, it's just like a phone line, you know, sometimes you call a doctor and you ask a question and he asks you a few questions to identify you and he give you some sort of information, right? So I don't see what's the problem to using those same channels of communication and making them HIPAA. I really hope that we're not going to see a, a huge change here because otherwise, as somebody works with doctors every day, it's going to be, again, you know, another adaptation phase and another kind of rejection for a lot of doctors who just don't want to use new systems because uh, beautiful things are happening right now. No matter what's the medium, if it's Skype or Google or, or whereby or, or Zoom, we see beautiful things happening uh, with telehealth. Not that it's a solution for everything, but at least it's kind of a forced adaptation of innovation. Yeah. I'm somehow thinking about the Stockholm Syndrome where we know that there's a problem, you know, but yet we do it anyways. <laughs> we fall in love with the people who abuse us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it seems like since the crisis is going to last a little bit longer, unless we have a vaccine soon, which is probably not likely. And it's probably good that it's, if we don't have it soon, because I think it should be well tested before it's used on humans. I think doctors and healthcare industry will be using those tech that is not HIPAA compliant for a little bit longer. That is going to be super dangerous. And I hope they're not going to sell those and exploit the crisis in that kind of way. Let's talk about some brighter things. What is going to be the future of healthcare? Ideally, how should we handle the, <laughs> I know that the, the crisis here in the U.S. and also where you are, maybe globally, because it is global. And how should healthcare change in the future? I think that we are in a really pivotal moment in time uh, with healthcare because we reached a really interesting capacity of, of technology and training that we can provide adequate care in major parts of the world. Um, of course, we, we, we're talking about developing countries that we have a long way to go, but um, I think that we, we should learn from what's happening in China, for instance, to look at what's gonna be um, the future of healthcare. Um, in China, basically, they're utilizing any piece of technology that they can to to make an outreach for the rural part. So you have um, already, even though you have hospitals and clinics and, and organizations that take care of, of people there, ba basically everybody is insured, um, you're still going to see there um, almost everyone using some sort of health consultation app. And I think what's interesting about it is that we are moving to an era uh, of kind of more consumer health instead mm -hmm. of kind of more global health. Um, if it's up to me, you know, I'm, I'm more socialist when it comes to healthcare, so I would love to see everybody get covered. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that learning from what's happening in China and other developing countries, when you don't have enough doctors in the field, I think that what we're going to see is we're going to see more decision support AI systems mm -hmm. helping um, providers in the field, I'm not calling them doctors because it may be health officers in Africa, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, that are going to actually be the ones hands-on with the patient, whatever they are. Um, and those providers are going to use a lot of um, decision support. I think that we're going to see in general a lot of AI coming in um, everything that we, we see today as imaging, radiology, histology, pathology, everything is going to be automated in, in, my, in my view. Eventually, we can call this kind of medicine in the cloud because the, the abuse of the time of our provider cannot stay for longer. And when we are looking at countries other than the U.S., countries that actually try to optimize the time that doctors have with patients. Mm -hmm. I think we, we are in the, in the last few years of those doctors spending 50, 60% of their time typing in, those things are going to be completely automated. Like, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that um, 
it's going to start with elderly homes, but we're going to see more Alexa and other assistants in um, doctor's offices, automating the processes. And um, if you, when you get to see the doctor, because in many of the time, I think that you're going to be kind of navigated in a way that you're not supposed to see the doctor unless you really need it, do most of the testing at home. You see beautiful things happening today, like there is an Israeli company, Healthy.io, that got their first FDA approved urine test that you can, it's a kit that you can do at home. We're going to see blood tests being done at home. We're going to see um, more assistants and trainers and other um, devices or apps that help educate you to better health behaviors. And unfortunately, we're probably going to see incentive being made by insurers. Um, but I think the biggest impact we are going to feel in our daily life um, are going to be wearables. And I think it's a cool discussion to have what's going to be with wearables because I believe that in the next few years it's going to be a complete revolution of what we perceive as health in general. I wanted to ask you a little bit about collaboration uh, with, the, with the corona crisis today. We do not see a lot of collaboration globally. Of course, you know, this is a virus that impacts every country, every person out there. And, you know, you have a few countries that have gone through previous virus and they know exactly what to do. And then there are other countries who were led by leaders who basically shut down the country immediately. And they were really successful in controlling the, the virus. And then we have other countries like the U.S. who didn't believe that the virus is real. In fact, I think a lot of people think that it's just like the flu. And there seems to be a lot of disconnect between different countries. And so I want to talk about collaboration and how countries could collaborate on things like science and health. Because besides politics and sanctions and all those kind of stuff. I think health doesn't discriminate and it impacts everyone. How can we do a better job on working together globally? I think, Michelle, it all comes back to the dissemination of knowledge of the democratization of it. Maybe you can um, um, talk more about uh, tokenizing and blockchain and so <laughs> on, but in, in general, because you, you, you're, you're more expert than I am in this field, but as I see it, it's kind of a joke, you know, that as long as we're looking at scientific data as a product that gains a ego and awards and mm -hmm. kind of money and, and like the, the entire incentivization system of producing those paper led to the fact that a lot of the science around us is basically um, paper producing machine, a huge machinery. And we have all the con con technology and, and uh, systems in the world right now that we can actually create kind of a global hub of knowledge mm -hmm. that can be verified and shared. But we don't do it because um, basically academia is used to be very solitary and very, very competitive. And I think this is the, the cause route because you see some beautiful collaboration happen here in the Europe we have EU versus virus, the series of hackathons, mm -hmm. and people comes together online and trying to solve it. I was, I was a mentor in a few of them. But again, these are solution, innovative-based solution. Um, the science itself is very blurry what's happening right now. You, you are bombarded with information, mainly popolitical, populized kind of you know, um, information because you see those reporters, reading uh, some sort of results being made in some institution and then the title becomes very very dramatic and then we have a new title but the knowledge itself is not sure enough um, <laughs> i think that this this is the exact time to use open science and and open innovation and open source even in the solution that we you know if we have a validated concrete knowledge about something um, we should allow in this time of crisis open source solution and not just kind of uh, wait on co companies to capitalize on 
uh, the crisis to make it. So again, it's all about how we treat uh, knowledge and how we treat power. And if it's up to me, because I worked in an in a, um, organization that produces a lot of research, um, I think that uh, the most beautiful thing we can do right now is to completely democratize it and open source it. But, you know, I'm only a little pin in the system, right? Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, of course, as, as a futurist myself, I, I believe in sharing knowledge and democratizing information and, and also not just democratizing information, right? Because you can search anything on Google and, and that's knowledge, right? But it's really about validating it and making sure that it's true, like even outside of Wikipedia, right? And to make sure that people are incentivized for providing real information and true information and validating those information, making sure that those are real, making sure that those are usable, right? And then incentivizing the science community to share those information so that people can use it. Um, I think I think that will be really important. I really don't, cause cause I mean, from me personally, just knowing the healthcare industry, it just they just seem so slow to change, right? So it, it's really rethinking because I participated in the in the global hack, right? The hackathon, the yeah. for the virus, and I, I it was really inspiring to see so many people trying to solve it because I think all of us care about the world. And, but now things have gotten so complicated because, you know, even if journalists and media shared about certain information, they may not be real and their titles are, are written in a way to attract viewers. Um, and, you know, some of them have a political agenda or slant. So it's really difficult to to understand to find information that is pure for that purpose of helping the world you know i think that eventually um we have in place organization that's supposed to lead us through crises like this right like the world health organization i'm not going to say anything about the u.s leaving it and what i think about it yeah but um yeah. uh eventually we have we have scientists that are working, you know, really against the clock every day, trying to beat this thing. And every day we have new evidence that something is changing, happening, better or worse, but we have data. Mm -hmm. We don't have a single system, even I'm talking about like per nation, I don't know of any single national system that accumulates all this data, not only the statistics, every country collects statistics, I'm talking about the science the data that can help us come up with new protocols. And I think the problem is that we are still using the same old political structures to meta, manage crises like this. Yeah. You know, if, if we actually have in every country um, an agency like uh, some sort of a FEMA run, running this crisis and not the regular politician that are busy doing whatever they're doing, Maybe we'll see better results because it, it's really a, sometimes looks like a circus when you look at different countries and, you know, you have this advisor and this advisor and, and they're kind of debating with themselves. It's supposed to be very simple because it's science, right? We have facts and yeah. we, should, we should kind of react to the facts, but it's actually processing the facts and politically kind of leading uh, um, the decisions. So, you know, maybe we should... Uh, lead us back to uh, open governance and uh, you know kind of other solutions ai governance in situation like this i really wonder what an ai model would do in a situation like this yeah um, i mean i think i think it could be programmed so that is more scientific i mean especially with science information i think here with with us and with the world today i think in order to get to one piece of information you have to basically strip off you know people's ego their fame their agenda how many views they want to get where they're going to advertise their target market where they're going to get to the career their connection i mean it, it's kind of crazy you know i mean like literally if someone has or got sick they just want to make sure that they're well <laughs> um and we just want to lower 
you know, the, the, the numbers. And, and we need a system that goes beyond the numbers and because people are like looking at numbers all day. Is there any, any more information than the numbers? Even like simple stuff like whether it's good to wear a mask or not. You know, I mean, at first we have direction that we don't have to wear, we shouldn't wear a mask and then we should wear a mask. I mean, it's changed so much. Um, <laughs> and, and it's fine, I guess it's agile, right? But at the same time, you know, like even with some of the symptoms, we know that it's been changing. You know, first it was airborne, no, you know, it was airborne and then it was not airborne and then it was airborne. And it's kind of interesting to see the agency changing their mind every so often, you know, yeah. and, and there's not really concrete data that they should be using or following scientists, you know, <laughs> it's just like, why is their information not coming from scientists? Why are they making things up? It, it's, it's really interesting. I think, I think it's also depending on the way we kind of define who is our popular culture heroes nowadays, you know, um, we used to, be influenced by influencers that um, uh, usually the, the relation between them and science are really kind of far-fetched, okay? So I think that scientists for us are not uh, considered as kind of maybe mainstream uh, leaders or legitimate leaders. Um, we are really bombarded by information all the time, mostly very shallow one. And we are not taught in school to think critically. Maybe if you go, you know, to a very good university and so on. So I, I, think that it, it, I agree with you. I mean, I think with like Google, with information everywhere and with influencer, I think people are really losing um, their critical mind, which is really what school should be, should be teaching you. But I think the school system has changed. As, I mean, I'm talking about the U.S. So the system, the school system in the U.S. has changed a lot over the years. So I think, I think you're taught not to think critically, but to follow orders and, and to follow people. So you can't really be independent. So I think, I think I really don't know how the world is going to be like with that. And with science especially, because you have to think critically as a scientist. You have to make up hypotheses and then you have to test it. I just think that, you know, uh, how can we actually know what to do if um, we are trusting our leaders to give us one order at a time that makes sense? But then we are bombarded with <laughs> information that contradicts us, you know? So who do we trust? And uh, this is also a matter about kind of uh, um, public opinion. Uh, and, it seems like we do trust our leader. I mean, you know, when one of the leader tells us to drink certain substance to cure the virus, <laughs> people did that. I think it becomes dangerous when those information is not coming from doctors and scientists when it comes from influencer. Uh, you know, I, I think that kind of everybody is kind of experiencing what we as patients or kind of chronic illness, like chronic illness patients or disabled patients are experiencing every day this kind of bombardment of confusion it's what basically we experience all the time because we have a very very kind of minute conversation communication with our physicians and most of the time we're kind of left in the dark and this is funny that sometimes people kind of ask me why are you so happy during corona and i'm, I'm like welcome to my world because you know i i a lot of times we have to make our own decision based on mm -hmm. things that we read because we don't have a clear advice. And um, that's why I think that uh, in general, critical thinking is something we should develop. But regarding healthcare, I'm not sure that we are treating even this crisis as a health crisis because like, you know, it, it's such a huge social crisis as well. But in general, I think that we should kind of start to look at um, at what's happening on a daily basis in healthcare and kind of compare it to what's happening today. So first of all, we have a lot of people suffering because they cannot get proper care and they don't have Corona, right? They have other million things. Mm -hmm. But what do we do if we are now in a situation that it's going to last for years? So um, we are going to see more and more contradicting information 
um, without scientific proof. And we're going to see more and more uh, detachment between us and our, our care providers. Uh, I'm very concerned about the chronic illness population right now. Not because they're only, not only because they're very compromised and, and they're not getting the right um, kind of respects of being compromised. Um, I'm really concerned about the entire population being left in the dark. And this is something I think we should all think about. It just doesn't look really good right now. And we have in the U.S., we have certain states that opened up. And it seems like there's intense ramifications of doing so when decisions are not based on health and the impact of of that and it's true there are other illnesses and sickness that are going on too as well and i think socially and economically it has a big impact around the world on on different people and I think a lot of people are still working and, and I think in the US uh, people are talking about opening schools and because it's going to help the economy and people can go to work because then the kids will go to school. However, I'm just kind of concerned because the people who are actually working, they could get the virus from, from their children. It's really a time bomb right now. So it, it's interesting and i think there's still a lot of innovation needed in the health care patient in industry if there is someone who is concerned and they wanted to change the healthcare industry what can they do just globally or around the world like what do you say i mean as a patient how could you as a patient if you become sick what are some ways that you can do? Because I, I like to empower the community. There are certain things we cannot control, right? But as a patient, what can you control? And what can people do about their situation to alleviate it? So I think it's a very good question. And I'm also all about empowering patients. And that's what I do. I lead a patient organization and I'm a patient advocate. And I, I do global public speaking about uh, patient revolutions. But I think that eventually um, it's all come down to taking responsibility for your own condition, for your own body, for your own life. Many, many, many of my peers, like peer um, sufferers, they just wait for somebody in healthcare to give them a helping hand. And those people in healthcare are completely overburdened in regular days so let alone now in during this crisis i think that the, the like i didn't stress how sick i was i was bedridden to the fact that like uh, people asked me if i were on a wheelchair i couldn't even be on a wheelchair because i couldn't even sit so um i i became from completely bedridden to a completely functioning human just because i've decided to take responsibility and uh, I did something very extreme. I, I studied medicine from my own bed to diagnose my own condition. And I'm not saying that everybody should do that, but I think that if you take responsibility and you kind of take your own body as a project and using a startup method, like, you know, road mapping, exactly um, what's going to happen with you? What is the navigation path that you need to take uh, in order to, to get better? And there's so many professionals to help you today and, and materials and blogs and influencers. I think that this is the, the best thing you can do for yourself because sitting and waiting for healthcare to change is not going to change it. But raising your voice, joining a patient organization, joining a community, shouting out on social media, like what's happening with you? What do you need? Um, and not making it all private and secret and shameful, I think this is the best thing you can do for yourself. Yeah. So, so Roy, what are the three top three keywords to, to search? Just so that people would know. I mean, I would have, I have no idea about like how to even search that. So if you're a patient today and you need help, 
what kind of hashtag or keywords you should should you search there are a few that i really like like patiently waiting uh hashtag patiently waiting is, is one of them and then like it's kind of criticizing healthcare it's a very strong one chronic illness is a strong one patient power will be another one um and i think that um when you search those you'll see a beautiful phenomena that people with disabilities people with chronic illness are just all out there with their deformities if, uh, with their illnesses they are visible invisible but just being out there trying to help each other communities are being formed movements are being formed i'm i'm writing a book now called how to start a revolution from your bed and i'm talking about this patient led revolution and you see beautiful things happening so yeah so, so Roy, when when i was in berlin last year i i had kabat with you and yeah. you were <laughs> you're walking and happy sleep healthy and what happens how do you do that <laughs> i mean you, you were talking about road mapping and all that stuff like just just big picture wise how do you become sick in a bed to walk into having kabat with me <laughs> in berlin <laughs> <laughs> If you ask me like 10, 12 years ago, if I will ever be in Berlin walking uh, uh, with a very good friend from San Francisco eating kebab, I would say it's a pipe dream. But, uh, you know, what I did is basically, the first step was, you know, I, I was in a very bad shape. I was uh, thinking about ending my own life because my doctors basically gave up on me. Um, I have seen 33 doctors and the 33rd one told my parents that basically I will never going to work a day in my life, never going to uh, walk, never going to go to university, never going to marry a woman. And basically I came back home so broken that I didn't have any, any um, kind of hope. But luckily that night I read a book uh, by Dr. Viktor Frankl, who was a, a psychiatrist from Vienna, funnily enough. And he was... Um, prisoner in Auschwitz and he wrote this amazing book about resilience and responsibility. Later on he developed a system, uh, um, a psychotherapy method called logotherapy, basically bring back the power and empowerment to people by giving them responsibility and purpose. So that's what I did, I found purpose. Now I know that basically I was an entrepreneur all the time and I didn't know it, I was just kind of <laughs> using my body as my own kind of startup. I was yeah. going to start up and my <laughs> exit was actually walking and getting better. Um, but it, it, it was a journey, you know? Yeah, it was a journey of actually, you know, productizing myself and, and finding the right market, which was my doctors to actually convince them, you know, like my, uh, I had to find my investors to believe in me, you know, the, the yeah. system of care around me. And I had to find people who were, uh, be able to, um, you know, buy my story and actually believe me and support me along the way. And what I'm doing right now, is I'm trying to empower others. You know, I've been talking to uh, people in more than 50 countries already and it's all universal, you know. Sickness is, and, and health is very universal. It's a very human thing. Um, and I think that eventually there are a few methods that are basically all depending in your mindset that can help you start to get better. I'm not a healer, right? I'm not saying that everybody is healed now. I'm just saying that it's all in your head. Um, the mindset is the greatest thing you can do for yourself to change it towards a healthy mindset. And then you can start. Um, I urge people to follow me like on social media and see my journey and what I'm trying to do for patients. And my story is going to be featured hopefully next year in a Netflix film that I've been working on with a, uh, with a friend here in Austria, Sandra Noll, uh, trying to help people realize what is an healthy mindset. So Roy, I'm really big in mindset, as you know me. And that's yeah. why I asked you that question, because without that mindset shift, where someone tells you that they cannot heal you, to hey, I'm going to change this. I'm going to take responsibility for myself and I, I will basically change and I will create me. So you shift your mindset for sure. And, and I could sense that. And I know that. Not only that, you use your mindset to shift you 
<laughs> so that you can walk and you know be able to run and and do all that kind of stuff so you completely change you had a successful startup and that startup is you and it wouldn't happen without that mindset because everywhere everyone around you at that time told you that you know that they couldn't do they can't fix you they can't do anything and you know your life will not change but you did not believe that and the fact that you do not believe that but you believe in yourself and no one did. What was that? That has to be a turning point in your mindset. Was it after reading that book? What, what happened? I think that what happened was um, this night, the night that I read this book was the darkest night of my life. Yep. And I, tried to, I, I was trying to find a reason to leave. And I'll say, okay, I have a loving family. I have friends. Like, um, they will be really sad if I'm gone, but my life is not worth it like this. You know, I cannot even get out of bed to pee. You know, I don't have any quality of life, really. Uh, and, and my illness is called POTS syndrome. It's a funny name. It's a part of the uh, illnesses um, from the family of dysautonomia, a dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system. We have um, two parts of the nervous system, just quickly. The one that we control, like moving our hands and talking, and the one that we cannot control, like, um, you know, digestion, pulse. Uh, blood pressure and so on. So the entire autonomic or automatic part of my body was completely shattered. And uh, we don't know exactly why. It's probably an autoimmune response after I sustained a very traumatic event in the Israeli uh, military service. And I could not even move. Uh, there was an episode in the amazing show in Netflix Diagnosis that this guy has the same illness as me. And every time he tried to get out of bed, they think he has a heart attack, not, uh, like a heart, like a cardiac arrest. You know, mm -hmm. if I even slightly move my head, I would faint. And, and it was terrible. But in that night, I thought, what did I do in this world? And I remembered one moment. I was a volunteer in the Israeli Red Cross as, a, as an EMT. And um, there was one moment that I, I never say I saved the life of this and that. You know, I'm a volunteer. I'm part of the change of life saving. I'm trying to help people. But I distilled one moment in which I re realized that if I didn't do this and this action, this kid wouldn't be alive today to go to the army and college and, and, and so on. So wow. then I found this purpose that I actually saved the life. And maybe if I leave, I can help others, maybe heal others, maybe save the lives of others, maybe empower others to, to, to be healthy. And these kind of strings of thoughts made me realize that I still have a reason to leave. I have a purpose. And now it's time to take responsibility and not to wait for the, 34th and 5th doctors to help me, but to actually take matters to my own hands and find out what is this illness and then later on find out how to rehabilitate myself. So it's completely was a mindset changing that night. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm um, also emotional. That's amazing. I think like even when, when we have a cold, <laughs> we're like oh my god we have a cold oh my gosh and yeah. it just takes so much strength internal strength and and all that other stuff to actually ch change you around that is amazing how do people follow you oh so um i'm under my name Roy Sterling in all social media my handle in um uh, instagram is um i am roi like i'm roi abbreviated yeah i have a youtube channel i'm on twitter i'm on instagram I'm on facebook um there is a lot of things you can google me like um, newspaper stories about my story and so on that maybe can inspire people to kind of search for their own symptoms it's kind of crazy but there already been more than 40 diagnoses being made after people listening to my symptoms and then going to their doctor and try to investigate because they were bedridden for a few years so i really urge people to take control back and and be knowledgeable it's not your job to be your own doctor but you need to be responsible for your own health and um the last thing i want to say is that um in my view wherever we have a chief doctor and a chief nurse we should have a chief patient we should have patients in everywhere that they can make influence and i really think that people can really change their lives um just by changing their minds and and i'm the living proof you know i'm a patient that's coming from a bed fainting every five minutes to leading a senior role um in a health organization so i think it's a proof that really everything is possible 
Awesome. And before we go, what is that one advice that you wanted to provide to our community? Oh, stay open. Um, I, I really want people to, to think critically. If there is two things that schools should teach is like basically literacy and, and <laughs> you know, and critical thinking. Um, people can reach every information, you know, with their fingers today. And I think that we need to learn how to tell what's right and what's wrong and, and just educate ourselves. This is regarding everything, not only healthcare, but this thing saved my life, basically. My own ability to kind of analyze the information because I was bombarded, you know, in Google and everything. This critical thinking and, and learning how to tell my story saved my life. So, yeah, stay open. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so much, Michelle, for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.